Hello. Yeah. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is an update on Keystone Federation. And uh, we have lots of speakers on this talk. Most of them actually decided to show up. Uh, the famous guy, I think, is going to make a dramatic entrance. We'll, we'll see what happens there. Always exciting. Um, about the presenters. Um, Morgan, who will be here, or will never hear the end of it, is a uh, master technologist at HP. Um, we have um, Marik Denis, thank you, core for uh, Keystone. Uh, we have myself, um, Brad Topol, an IBM Distinguished Engineer. Um, we have Steve Martinelli, another core for Keystone. And uh, we have Rodrigo Duarte from uh, Universidad Federal de Campina Grande. And of course, Marek is from CERN. I don't want to uh, cheat him there. CERN's so much easier to remember than the other one. But OK, so agenda. We're going to cover Keystone. We're going to cover it quickly. Uh, we'll talk about the differences that people don't realize between the Identity API and Keystone. Um, we'll do a federation overview. Uh, we'll talk about all the cool updates we've been doing to Federation, and you see those here. Um, then we'll talk about how Federation is sort of r rolling its way out into some of the distros and you know what vendors are supporting it. And then we'll talk about future work and, and what's left to do. Um, but first, I'd like to say thank you to all of these folks that you see here. Uh, sometimes we kind of rotate. We can't get all of the wonderful folks that have contributed this effort up on the stage. Um, you know, we've had help from folks from the University of Kent. Uh, we've had help from Adam Young at Red Hat. Um, you know, we've had help from Joe Savick sitting there in the front stage, who's done this many a time. I mean, really one of the original drivers of this work. It's so nice of you to join us, sir. Really? I just thanked you and all your contributions. I'll add one more, making one of my co-speakers late. Thank you. All right. Um, so this has been, a, and, and of course, we've had newer folks come on board with uh, CERN and, and Universidad Federal de Campina Grande. It's really been a wonderful collaborative effort across the community to deliver some of the more complex functionality and tying in uh, our stakeholders directly into the work to make sure we are hitting the mark uh, and, and, and providing functionality in the space that we needed. So thanks to all of these great organizations that have been working in this space. Uh, Keystone in two minutes or less. So Keystone it provides, it's our identity and access management service, it provides authentication provides authorization, provides audit, basically provides the notion of identity, uh, also provides a service catalog and service discovery. Um, really important part of OpenStack, uh, every, I go talk to lots of customers, every enterprise customer we talk to, when you go and you're first getting started with OpenStack, you're typically hit with, well, how do I do OpenStack security? And how do I integrate it in with my existing identity provider, identity server, my LDAPs, my active directories? How do I do this in my existing protocol based for federated identity, federated identity managers, all these types of things? Key strength of OpenStack Keystone is it's very flexible and configurable to be able to integrate with whatever the, the customer has. This has been one of its strengths. Um, so it does support a variety of identity providers. It even supports a variety of token formats. It's got the little tokens. It's got the bigger tokens that are cacheable. It's got now some that are in the middle that are sort of just the right size because people didn't like too little or too big. So you know we're, we're, we're here to please. That's what we do. Um, and so you know from that perspective, used by all the different uh, services, we kind of like to feel that that you know it's kind of a big deal. All right, on that note, um, covering some things. Some people don't realize, you know, Keystone is, is, is the, the project. The actual API is what we call the identity API. And we've gone through sort of, there's two, two main versions of this, right? The original version that, that pretty much everybody got used to uh, was the V2. 
and uh, we added a V3, and in the V3s, you start seeing things like the notion of domains and groups, and we changed tenants, the name of the th uh, from tenants to projects, felt like projects would be uh, a little more easier to understand. That's been a kind of a, you know, pulling people out of that tenant uh, thought and making it projects. Um, and so all the new functionality has been going into the V3 API, and that includes federation as well. So, you know, your Keystone typically, you know, still a lot of folks using V2, but when you want to start using the newer features, uh, you need to start moving up to the V3 API. And we've been working a lot with a lot of the other projects to make that happen. Uh, another key change that's worth pointing out is how you deploy Keystone. Uh, originally, you'd run it uh, sort of standalone in what was called Eventlet. Nice, lightweight, easy to go, easy to use. But when it became time to grow up and you need more security, and it was time to grow up and you need to start using more of the federation-based protocols where you, know, you had you know, the extra libraries you needed for, for, uh, for federation like Shibboleth, it really became smart that the proper way to run this was as part of a, Apache and using the mod WSGI, underscore WSGI, to run it as part of Apache. So that is now the, uh, the official supported way to run it. It's been added to DevStack. That's the way to go, and uh, you'll be a lot happier running it in, in that deployment. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Steve to cover Federation. Thanks, Brad. Um, so Federation is kind of you want two kind of distinct um, entities to kind of collaborate and work together. And when most of the time when people think of Keystone and Federation, they immediately go for federated identity. But that's only one part of it. And when you break federated identity up, a lot of people start to think of it as identity providers and protocols. And those are the two main aspects of it. Um, to briefly define those, an identity provider is, um, you know, it's a place where a whole bunch of users are stored, um, and uh, you really want to use it for authentication. Uh, previously, Keystone was kind of handling all this itself, and people were saying that Keystone's acting like an identity provider. And that's not something we want, because most enterprises are not going to want to run Keystone as an identity provider. They have their own. Um, you know, oftentimes it'll be LDAP or Active Directory. Could be anything. Could even be MongoDB. Um, and you know, you need an identity provider to um, get that structured way of organizing users and then output it in, uh, represent a user in a, in a very specific way. And that's where the protocols come in. Um, and, you know, the two main ones that we've been focusing on in Keystone are SAML and OpenID Connect. SAML being the tried and true XML based way of representing a user. It's been out since like 2004. Um, whereas OpenID Connect just had its uh, 1.0 uh, spec sometime in late 2014. Uh, it's JSON based, which makes it really handy for working in Python. Um, however, it, it is a bit more web oriented, um, whereas SAML kind of had, I think, a slightly better support for uh, non browser flows. But when we talk about federated identity, I think this is what most people are used to seeing. They're seeing, you know, your sign in, single sign on Google account. You know, you want to use Google or Twitter or LinkedIn instead of creating a new user account on some other application. And, and that's pretty much like the most common use case that you're going to see. But that's just one use case of federated identity and federation. Um, but it is a very, very handy one. So, uh, yeah, and like I said, these users can be stored in whatever format you want. It can be, you know, MongoDB, LDAP, Active Directory, whatever, it doesn't matter. And again, like I know at our enterprise sign on, we're actually using SAML, but if you're using Google, it's going to be OpenID Connect. So we've been actually trying to, like, making strides toward federated identity in Keystone for a while now. And, um, you can see in Icehouse, we actually started by doing some basic support for federation setup. Just, you know, we wanted to create in, we wanted to create an identity provider resource, a mapping resource, protocol resource. We actually created a first the first iteration of the mapping engine to translate, you know, the attributes that you're getting from your identity provider 
two keystone attributes because those aren't going to be one to one. You're going to need some way of uh, an engine that can take, you know, if I'm an admin at Pepsi, and what does that mean on Keystone? What role do I get? And the basis of that is you're going to be put into a group, and that group is going to have a role, and that's how, and that's the main basis of the mapping engine. And then in Juno, we start to play around with the Keystone to Keystone support, and that was actually highlighted during the keynote, uh, the 9 a.m. keynote one on Monday. And that is kind of trusting two different keystones, allowing a user to go from one keystone and then using getting a token from one keystone and then getting another to and using that token on another keystone that's completely separate. Um, and that's kind of meant for like a burst scenario where you want to be able to use resources on another keystone. And then we focused on actually improving the clients because, as usual, they're always lagging behind. Um, and in Kilo, I'm actually going to highlight. Uh, all of us are going to go through uh, some of the improvements that we've been doing. But why would you want to use federated identity in Keystone? Um, you know, you could have a non-LDAP source. And Keystone, for the most part, provides great support for LDAP. But if you're not using LDAP, the support's a little wishy-washy. Um, and also, you know, you probably already have an identity provider in your enterprise. So you want to leverage that. And plus, it's really, really cool. <laughs> so updates to federation. Uh, we did quite a few updates to the federation in Kilo release. Um, but I'm just going to be talking about the web single sign-on. And this was pretty cool because it was, like I said, single sign-on is what most people think of when they think of federated identity. And it was really cool to get this finally in because, you know, it's visual. People can see it. They, you know, they can actually, it's easy to understand. And it's something that the community has wanted for a while. So together with the Horizon team, we actually worked a lot with the Horizon team on this. And it was one of the first times I've had to deal with uh, cross-project collaboration. And, you know, it took, some, it took some work, but we got it done. And what happens is, um, you know, you're going to hit the Horizon web page just like you normally would. And then from there, you can actually list the different ways of, that you want to authenticate. So you can go through the normal username and password flow, or you can select one of the other protocols. And each protocol has a default identity provider associated with it. So in this case over here, say, it's OpenID Connect, which is backed by Google, because that's how I set it up. If you were to click Connect on that, you're going to see the Google branded login page. It's going to redirect you right to it. And from there, once you sign in, you'll actually be redirected back into Horizon. And you know that's actually the top right screen of Horizon, where you actually see the Google uh, the username. And in this case, it's something at accounts.google.com. And this was important because you know, branding is important. People want to see a familiar login page when they're, when they're logging in. It's kind of awkward to type in one identity provider's credentials into, into an OpenStack branded web page. It was kind of weird. Um, and even then, you can tell from the URL, it's not what you're used to. And uh, you know, we created a bunch of extensive documentation for this. And CERN actually is using it in their production clouds right now. Anyway, uh, talk about the mapping enhancements is, I think, Merrick. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So um, uh, mapping enhancements we did uh, in Itkin Kilo. Um, just a short reminder what the mapping engine in, Keys in Keystone is. It's our secret weapon for um, OS federated workflow. So it's something which actually, just like Steve explained, translates um, you know, the credentials uh, which are put in the, in the SAML assertion or the OpenID Connect uh, claim into something which is usable for Keystone. So in that case, it would be user ID, username, or its domain, and the groups this member will be mem and the, the groups the the user will be member of. So, um, um, as I said, this is a very powerful module. Um, we are trying to 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 add the new features because it, it will ease the use cases and it will make you know all this configuration even easier. So, um, during the Keystone uh, Kilo um, cycle, we added a couple of new features. So, um, one of them would be the ability to identify the effective users by name and, don and the domain uh, because up to, up to you know, before Kilo you could only identify the users by the user ID. Um, we did, it was done basically for uh, being able to map the um, to, to map to the local users. I mean, you may you may want to this. I mean, it's a great use to, it's a great way to use your corporate ODAP uh, or the IDP to provide a first class authentication method. Like you know, it may align to the policies at your cor corporation that you have to authenticate through the IDP. 
it's it just leverages the you know authentication to the to the first class identity provider um, if how how should you build your mapping mapping rules just use the name and the and the domain of your effective user and just specify any other domain than the federated yeah the other another f enhancement was the i think the service domain which is called federated uh, which means that if the if a effective user is a member of the federated uh, domain he is an ephemeral user so i mean you know the users being ephemeral is like the core uh, design decision which we made in the in the os federation so so th this is th this this is how how we how we just started you know thinking about this, and this this is as I said this is a service domain so basically you cannot create this domain you don't have to create this domain before you before you know set, uh, configuring the um, OS federation in OpenStack but you also will not see this domain when you list all the domains you cannot delete it you cannot you cannot alter this domain. Um, Another feature is the um, whitelisting and blacklisting of in, in the mapping rules. This is again, um, it, this was requ requested for so-called Adam Young's use case, and then you're going to history. <laughs> uh, this is uh, it's it's extremely useful when you when you're dealing with some complex parameters like the list of the groups uh, which are issued by the uh, by the identity provider. So. For instance, Adam wants to to create his, you know, his uh, he he wants to reuse his his groups from the LDAP. He wants to create the the, the groups in the in the in the custom configuration, and then he he wants the users, um, you know, from the LDAP uh, to become you know, members of this group. So instead of just creating the the mapping where he, he maps the groups from all the all the combinations of the groups from uh, from LDAP and, and the local and the local groups in Keystone he will simply just pass all these all those uh, groups and use the black and use use the blacklist or white list so um you know you always want to need to be able to define the maximum set of the groups this user will, will this user will become a member of so um yeah, this is an, exa an example of the of the very simple um, mapping set uh, where you have uh, just simply yeah you will you will basically map all the all the groups which are stored in the parameter called remote user groups. Uh, you are not blacklisting anything. You could probably blacklist anything uh, which is like the you know negative uh, um, filtering, and you could li you could use the whitelisting for the positive filtering. And then uh, you know uh, the mapping engine will try to match all the existing groups uh, all the existing groups in the in, in Keystone. Um, okay, so Keystone, Keystone uh, again. Um, thanks to Morgan, you all know what's that, I guess, I suppose. But um, again, some some small uh, small refreshment. So it basically provides the underpinnings for interoperable uh, hybrid cloud ena uh, enablement. Um, in Keyst in Juno, we just you know we just uh, provided the experimental implementation for Keystone to Keystone. Uh, basically, what to do? You get your token. You swap the token, uh, you know, for the for the SAML assertion. So basically, the other format of, of your identity, um, and you just send this so send the SAML assertion to to the fully federated trusted cloud. Um, uh, you get the you get the new token back. Now you're 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 good to go and use the the remote cloud like you know uh, like like you, you you authenticate with the remote cloud. Uh, we leverage on the so-called IDP initiated SAML workflow. So you always go you always go to to the to the your local keystone, which happens to be the ID, identity provider in this case, in the SAML terminology, and it's it keystone to keystone basically provides the the building blocks for the interoperable hybrid clouds. So we'll for sure use it for for other services and uh, you know not only keystone to keystone federations, or but also we want to build some image sharing services and things like this. Um, so this was Juno. Uh, in Kilo, we focused on hardening Keystone to Keystone support, as well as as uh, you know as as far as as, as of Keystone, the the Keystone to Keystone um, uh, is is marked as stable. So you are good to go. And Morgan proved that <laughs> you can actually use it, and it even makes some movies. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's a very important industry, probably more, more useful than the physics. <laughs> okay, I, d I didn't say this. I wouldn't say that. Yeah, no, it's no, it's not. I just I I, I roll back. Anyway, um, anyway, um, yeah, and in Kilo we 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 fix on the on some critical bugs and focus on usability. So basically, we we just fix a, a major bug where Kiston was unable to correctly validate the signature of the SAML assertion. So it was a extremely um, you know a severe bug. Thanks to HP folks, we are we are now safe and secure. Uh, we made using uh, Keystone to Keystone easier for the, from the client perspective, where we just dropped the dependency for for the XML. Um, the server side just just does the does the does the hard work for for us. So client just needs to fetch the um, 
HD sample assertion, um, which is wrapped with some soap, uh, some blocks, and uh, it just passed to the to the remote service providers. Uh, we also decided not to piggyback on the overloaded region term terminology, which brought us to adding some new whole set of, of objects, which are called um, service providers. And um, Rodrigo will tell you some more about service providers. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Um, so, an improvement that we made in, in Kilo release was the addition of the service provider concept uh, to represent these kind of uh, remote trusted peers. In Juno, as Mark said, we tried to overload the region uh, resource, but we figured out that we need a lot of more information to properly represent this external service provider. So as of Kilo, we have this new uh, API uh, to manage this new type of resources. Um, besides that, uh, we added the list of service providers in the, alongside the self-catalog in the token. So once a user requests a token from Kishton, um, the list of service providers that he can access is inside the token. And um, as Mark explained as well, um, you won't be able to use your QHent token for your original Kishton to in the service provider cloud. You would need to request a SEMA session from your original keystone and present this session to the service provider and then retrieve a token that will work in this, in this external cloud. Uh, you can see on the right uh, the, how, how it would appear in this token. And it's, it has all the information that a client needs to burst into this uh, external cloud. So we also added this, this API to Kishon client, OpenShack client, so operators are, are good. It's easy to maintain and update this, this new resource. And of course, if you have more than one SaaS provider in your token, um, the whole list will be returned, and this is really useful for, for clients like Horizon. You would be, Horizon would display the whole list that of SaaS providers that the user can access, ha has access. Another update was uh, we added the, the to Kishon uh, the capacity to generate ECP sessions. ECP is, is um, it stands for Enhanced Client of Proxy, uh, which is an, an extension from the SMU2 protocol. Um, so the, one of the differences is that in peer SEMA, the standard SEMA that we use this web SSO, um, the SEMA session is encapsulated inside of a uh, SOAP envelope. And it's really useful, this extension is really useful when we are trying to run a non-browser workflow like running the protocol in a command line interface. So today, Keystone can return a pure summer session uh, via the OS uh, OS Federation summer 2 endpoint and this new uh, rapid ACP rapid summer session via this other endpoint. So since Keystone um, our right, has this capacity to return the ECP session. Clients uh, do not do not need to worry about um, getting the this the original session, putting it inside a uh, SOAP envelope, and then send to the service provider. So clients clients do not need to worry anymore about um, an XML or import XML libraries. So Keystone to Keystone suddenly. Uh, becomes a lot easier in this release, and it's even possible to write uh, a proof of concept where you where you can access your uh, service provider via your own horizon. So, using federation, can I use it? Uh, I think that Morgan showed yesterday that we can, and. Um, in the university, we had this use case where we had like this Juno deployment with Keystone and Swift, and we wanted to add this new cloud, and we wanted to uh, that the users from this new cloud to have access to this previous deployment. So what we did was we used Keystone to Keystone, and now the, the the users from this Kilo cloud, new cloud has access to this old June deployment. Everything works. So I'll pass to Mark, that is going to explain the certain use case. 
Yeah, so um, CERN uses the um, Identity Federated Federation for a long time. Um, we have uh, lots of users coming and leaving our organization um, you know, every month, um, so it's really easier to have one single point of identity rather than just multiple you know, websites or services you know, adding and, and removing users locally. Um, we, are, um, we are using the Microsoft A Active Directory and as well as the Active, Active Directory Federated Services for, for, for this configuration. We have roughly 12,000 service providers inside our organizations. I'm, I mean, I'm not talking still about the cloud, but you know, you know, it's, it all aligns to the, to the, one, to the one setup. Um, we internally use the Shibboleth as, as a service provider, so uh, ModShib. Um, yeah, this, uh, uh, of, of course, we are also, I mean, we, ju we then just came up with the, with, the, with the some idea that probably just, you know, using also the, the, the Identity Federation in cloud would be extremely useful. Um, we just drove requirements by filling some gaps. Um, you know, and one of those gaps was, was lack of the web SSO at the, at the time of Icehouse and the, and the, and the later releases. Uh, we basically sketched up some kind of a, a proof of concept which, which actually worked pretty, pretty well and then it was used for the, for the Keystone team to actually build the, the upstream um, reference uh, solution which we are just you know having right now in the in the on, on the on the github and uh, we yeah just like i said so when you go to the openstack.cernch uh, which is uh, which is the endpoint for all the users using our production cloud you will be redirected to the our identity provider service web web page where you are supposed to authenticate yourself so and we've been we've been running this this configuration since september 2014 so it's and it's it, it works pretty well. Um, we also support OpenStack client, uh, you know, as a CLI, which is, so we also feature the, uh, you know, V3 uh, identity V3 API as well as you, you can also authenticate via the Kerberos. Um, so please go ahead and feel free to use it. <laughs> it's proven and tested. <laughs> Morgan. So as Merrick was saying, is it real? Yes. Absolutely. You've got many different organizations already using it. Can you use it? Well, of course. We proved earlier this week that you absolutely can. As of, uh, as of uh, the time of the keynote here, Federated Identity is available within the HP Public Cloud. It is definitely for proof of concept purposes. We have a variety of things that go along with you know, accessing how, how we handle which customers are, you know, work with it, that type of stuff. It was done for proof of concept, but we got all the work. Did, oh, but, and we got all the work into get to get it as, as a feature that is possible uh, within the public cloud. Successfully used with digital film tree, as you saw, and we definitely have the target of making it generally available across the board in, in an upcoming Helion release. When it comes to the IBM front, I'm going to let Brad talk about this because somebody might, you know. Sure, I understand completely. Um, thank you. So we do have at our booth a, a demonstration of the federated identity, and, and that work shows uh, two, two clouds working together with it, and, and a little bit more. Um, it, it uses some patches that haven't quite merged yet, but allows you to, to do a little more on the UI side, which, which people seem to like in the demo. Um, we're going to have this available in our on-prem offering, the IBM uh, Cloud Manager with OpenStack uh, in June. And uh, third quarter of this year, we're going to have this available in our, um, you know, our private dedicated offering. So, you know, the, the offering that is, we manage it for you, but it's your dedicated uh, cloud. So, you know, you're starting to lay the groundwork there for folks that want to do on-prem and, and then burst up to a, to a, to a dedicated cloud. Um, and so, yeah, feel free to come by for a demo. And yeah, as said here at the bottom, just keep in mind that it isn't just the big organizations. It isn't just what you've seen here at the summit. We've got many, many different people working on this, many people successfully deploying it. HP, Blue Box, IBM, um, Red Hat's been working on it. And you saw the slide earlier on everybody who is planning on supporting. So what's left to do? We have a lot of stuff still along the way that we need to, we need to solve in the grand scheme of things. 
we need better functional testing. Clearly, having a great test suite that highlight, uh, uh, tests everything end to end, make sure that we have real setup of active peer, you know, active peers. We don't have this, you know, kind of a test mock-up solution. Truly testing end to end for the service provider mode, the identity provider mode, and simply the clients. But what do we need to make that happen? We need a lot. Currently, you need at least two, uh, two different keystones, different hosts, or at least different endpoints. But that gets a little bit weird, as you may have found out if you try and change things too much in OpenStack on the endpoints. And you can't rely on just a unit test. I mean, unit tests, what are they? They test that your logic works. That's not what we're talking about here. We've got preliminary work. It's underway. We have a lot of people focused on making sure that we have these functional tests. And, but it, it, we do need to take care of getting even the base framework for these types of functional testing uh, taken care of. The other side of it is, what would be an identity provider you can stand up quickly? If you've looked at the documentation and what's been described here, ModShib and Shibboleth, that's not a small amount of setup. It's a whole service. It has XML requirements, uh, certificate requirements. There's a, there's a lot that goes into it. Maybe we should look at something else. Well, we have something else we're looking at. That's the PySAML2 library. It's very basic, but it should be sufficient. And we definitely expect to have a full set of gate jobs validating everything for the federated services uh, in, in OpenStack, federated entity, including hopefully uh, having third-party CI for the uh, identity providers that we don't run in gates. More proprietary, uh, you know, it'd be like the Tivoli's or Active Directory, that type of stuff. I'm going to. I no, is it this one? Me, really? No, oh, <laughs> I don't know about this one. I remember this slide. <laughs> so, how do you deploy this? Well, you can deploy it with Chef, Ansible, Puppet, SaltStack, but we don't really have any of those tools built. What do we need to do? We only need to have them support the, all the crazy configuration stuff for the Apache modules, getting Shibboleth set up. I mean, I know that we have some of the stuff internally for HP because we've deployed this. But it doesn't mean that it's out there and open source. We're working on getting that out there. The, we would definitely want some volunteers. Please join us if you have expertise in this stuff. We'd be very happy to have you. <laughs> especially like the really creepy demon looking cats. So at this point, if you have any questions, please ask. We might even have an answer for you, but no guarantees on that. Uh, and use the mic if you're asking. Yeah, please please use them. And please use the mic. We have right there. Oh, really? Well, pa pass one of the mics up. All right, all right, all right, all right. You know what? I am making, Guang, you're responsible yeah, for handing true. this out. <laughs> uh, you see that? Delegation. <laughs> Leadership. That's what the PTL does. Uh, go ahead. I have a question. Um, uh, would it be possible to somehow backport it to the uh, ice house, or should we wait two kilo? Uh, we can't. No. The for your, the the size of the feature set that goes into the Keystone to Keystone stuff and the amount of options and changes that had to happen to make that apparent, backporting it at least up in the upstream stable branches is not really feasible. Hmm. We typically don't up, don't backport features. I, I think what would be more practical for you to test, and I'm not suggesting do this because you void your warranty, is to try running just a kilo keystone if you need to leave the rest of your cloud alone. The, the, the rest of the cloud should work with an upgraded keystone. There's nothing in keystone kilo that will not run a Juno cloud, but like I said, you're voiding your warranty. I can, Mike and Mike too. <coughs> okay. You go, you go, you've been waiting. I don't, I don't know if you have permission to do that. I can delegate that to you. Okay, so during the time that the, uh, the other so mic doesn't work, I will ask my question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, my question uh, was about uh, the WebSSO. So uh, you've uh, put a great screenshot about how it works. With um, So I guess that um, 
the service provider has to know the list of IDPs beforehand, so um, and get the metadata uh, really frequently. Um, I have a question: Is there a plan to support a discovery service or? Well, the uh, discover, serv discover service is a part of the, um, you know, it, I think it can be used as the third party uh, piece of software. I know Shibboleth just, uh, you know, when, when you read the docs of, uh, from the Shibboleth website, they usually say, okay, so here's something you can use. I mean, they even provide some, some kind of a discover service software. So um, I think we, we can try at, at the moment leverage as much as we can because I think those, this, I mean, those, those applications are doing the, the great job. I mean, is there anything which you know which you are still missing, or like, or you would like to have it in the somewhere in the in, you know, directly in Keystone? Yeah, uh, not. I would like to. No, I would like to s simply use the discovery service that I already have instead instead of uh, instead of implementing it again with Keystone. But you I don't can. know if it works. You can. In fact, that's exactly what CERN is doing. Okay. It's just it's just SAML. Okay. Okay. I, I have another uh, thing to add. It's not a really a question. It's, it's about uh, the the fact that uh, you need uh, help about some things. So um, basically, you were speaking about Chef Puppet, uh, etc. And um, we have a project at our company that is basically building an IDP as a service. So we will have uh, some kind of uh, um, Ansible recipes to build Shibboleth as a service. And so maybe this could be great for testing. Anyway, yeah, that was be. my two cents. Okay. All right, sir, your other question there? You've been Thank waiting. You. <laughs> um, so first of all, congratulations for getting there. You know, uh, it's an important milestone for the OpenSec community. However, my question is actually not related to Federation, and it's a si much simpler use case, if I may, um, having all of you um, there on the panel. Um, the question is, um, how about enabling um, customers, people that are using OpenStack clouds, um, to define their own roles and within their own roles, their own policies, um, and say, hey, here are my sysadmins, they have access to my production servers, so being able to go as far as here are the resource ID that I allow them to manage and touch, and here are the resource IDs that I don't allow them to manage and touch, because that's a much simpler use case than what we're actually expecting. I, I think I, I don't you missed the talk on, on it. <laughs> I, I we had a talk on it. To Adam. Yeah, we, yes, dynamic policy. It's underway. We, we, are, we, are, we, we are working on making stuff like that. Yes. Making stuff like that possible. Adam has been working extensively on it. Uh, you, should, you should definitely give information to Adam and yeah. sync up with him. He's a great resource on this. Yeah, you might be able to find him in here. He's the guy with the red hat. Oh, there and, he is. And, and he, might, he might be jumping up and down excited so that you asked that question. Okay, first of all, thanks for the presentation. It's really great to see that this is so far, and I guess we're shutting down. But if I have time, uh, how about OpenStack CLI support for ECP in non Keystone to Keystone existing SAML federations? So it, um, it all comes down to the auth plugins, and some of those are already in uh, Python Keystone client. We're currently kind of sorting out that and trying to think about how to best set it up. But there is support for SAML and, and Kerberos for OpenStack clients, so you could use those in a non-Keystone-to-Keystone -keystone way. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks.